This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone, good evening. This is Visual Conard from Conard Classes. Today we are going to discuss the physics problem but uh, I shared at the end of the last class. This is in continuation of our KBPI online session, which we started in last August 1, 2018. I hope I am able to hear all of you. So I request few students to say me hi. Okay. Uh, I'm able to hear, uh, you know, okay, great. Good. Thank you. So let us start our session then. Okay. So here is the question number 16. It says, ball one collides head on with another identical ball two at rest. Velocity of ball two after collision becomes two times to that of ball one after collision. The coefficient of restitution between the two balls is what? That is the question. So, For all of your kind information, the coefficient of restitution is the ratio of the final to initial relative velocity between two objects after they collide. Okay. So how we can compute is that, is that let Q be the initial speed of ball one. So here I'm going to write. Let U be the initial speed of ball one. Yeah, sure, Sri Ganesh, I can uh, repeat the definition of coefficient of restitution. So, coefficient of restitution is the ratio of the final to initial relative velocity between two objects after they collide. Generally, it is in the range from 0 to 1. And when it is 1, that means it is a perfectly elastic condition. So let u be the initial speed of ball 1. And v1 and v2 be the speed after collision and let v1 and v2 be the after collision speed of ball one and two respectively. Now, so then if you have studied the coefficient of restitution and then you'll get this thing, then we get We get the following so 
so v1 v1 is the speed of what v1 is the speed of the first ball after collision so that should be equal to 1 minus e by 2 into u where u is the initial speed of ball 1 and v2 is equal to 1 plus e by 2 into u so according to the question what is v2 v2 is equal to 2 into v1 if you read in the question after collision the velocity of ball 2 after collision become 2 times of that of ball 1 so according to the question what we get absolutely so uh, the point is that according to the condition the velocity of the ball 2 that is you know after collision that is v2 is two times of that of the ball 1 after collision that means v2 is equal to v1 according to the question according to the question what we get v2 is equal to 2 into v1 this implies what this implies 1 plus e by 2 into u is equal to 2 times 1 minus e by 2 into u this implies one plus e is equal to two times one minus e since u cannot be equal to zero because there must be an initial velocity of the ball one otherwise the question is of no meaning so from here what we get from here you get one plus e is equal to two minus two e and eventually we get e is equal to 1 by 3 and we get the correct option as a Okay, so if you have any question, please, uh, you know, uh, write in your chat box so that I can get back to you accordingly. Okay, so now let's go to the second question. So next question. Okay, yeah, Sri Ganesh, so I got your message. So first statement uh, is that, uh, you know, you want to mean the definition of coefficient of restitution or uh, how I started approaching the problem. So if I repeat the definition of coefficient of restitution, it is uh, the first step. Okay, so let u be the initial velocity of the ball one he in this context the speed and velocity of you know of same meaning of ball one and v1 and v2 so ball one was at rest sorry ball two was at rest so this is the ball two it was at rest and here is the ball one it is coming with a you know velocity of u sorry it comes with a velocity of u and ball 2 this is ball 1 and this is ball 2 ball 2 was at rest after hitting what happened is that see, this is before hitting okay before you know collision before collision this is the picture this is at you know velocity 0 after collision what happens
after collision the ball two you know started moving with a this ball two started moving with a velocity v2 and the ball one started moving with a velocity v1 that is the case now according to the condition what is given is that v2 is equal to 2 into v1 and then based on the relationship of coefficient of restitution we can find this relationship v1 is equal to 1 minus e by 2 into e and v2 is equal to 1 plus e by 2 into e and after that we use the condition as given that is v2 equal to 2 into v1 and then after that it is just mathematical derivation towards the solution okay shall we go to the next question then thank you sri ganesh okay so next question is this if you look into the figure you know here the question is that uh, you know what is the current flowing through the resistance to r um, if you look into the you know diagram very minutely it is actually a parallel representation of these three resistances if you consider the you know you know wheatstone bridge from that wheatstone bridge we can make the parallel you know configuration something like this it will be the parallel configuration it will be something like then here it is the resistance okay and if you look into this one so this is r this is 2r and this is also it is r and this is the point a according to the question and this is the point b so what happened if we consider the resultant resistance okay that means what that can be equivalent to like this that we have a resistance and it is just connected like this then what would be this will be we can say r you know r yes resultant uh let's see uh, whether it is uh, uh, let's see so according to the you know 1 by r of r yes is equal to as we know from the parallel combination 1 plus r by 1 by 2r plus 1 by r and from there what we get we get this is equal to you know 5 by because 2r is the lcm and here you get 2 plus 1 plus 2 that is equal to 5 by 2r so that implies that resultant res is equal to 2r by 5 so as if we have a single resistance of 2r by 5 so current in all resistance flow from positive terminal of the battery to the negative terminal of the battery okay and we get uh, you know from right to left that is you know we get the option b okay so i hope it's clear and if you have any question please do ask me yeah 
but the direction become opposite no no the thing is that the flow of electron and the flow of current exactly opposite there is something called electronic current and the you know flow and and the flow of current correct exactly okay so let's proceed yes yes bharat correct it is it is opposite so let's go to the next question this is a very interesting question and those who have you know already discussed with the you know um, a sinusoidal curve as you see the traveling of that you know wave is like a sine wave and if you are aware of the sine wave so its general equation is something like y equal to i am writing this equation this is traveling in sine wave this is traveling in sine wave so what is the equation we know the equation is equal to y is equal to a sine k into x minus omega into t interestingly there are three parameters here first parameter is x second parameter is y and third parameter is t the time generally we are habituated to see a graph of two variables but here there are three parameters what i define now if you look into the so what you need to find in this out of this question we need to find the value of we need to find the value of a k and omega so that we can apply all these values and to find that one so first of all for foremost we need to find the the value of lambda the wavelength if you look into the adjoining diagram from the diagram what do we get so let's give this equation as equation number 1 first now if you look into the adjoining diagram from that diagram we can say it is that in 5 into lambda by 2 that is equal to 20 correct okay so here is the question uh, as you see in the screen okay find the wave for the wave shown in the below figure the equation of the wave what is the equation of the wave what is y equal to you know a sin k x minus omega t you need to find what is the equation you see in all these uh, you know four options there is an expression which you know equal to y so you see here 5 lambda by 2 is equal to 20 and in the along x axis it is in centimeter so be very careful to convert into a meter so from here what we get from here we get lambda is equal to 8 cm and that is equal to 8 into 10 to the power minus 2 meter that conversion is very important now what is k we know k is equal to 2 pi by lambda what is k k is the number of wavelengths per unit length oh okay so here you see there are five five of five lambda by 2 because the entire wavelength there is one from here if you look into the diagram adjoining diagram you know from this point to this point just a minute uh from okay got it okay great so now 
So what we get k, k is equal to 2 pi by lambda. What is k? k is equal to 2 into pi by lambda. What is k? k is the number of wavelengths per unit length. That is 2 pi by lambda. And if we apply the value of 2 pi by lambda, what is the value of pi? We know the value of pi is equal to 3.14 divided by lambda. What is lambda? Lambda is 8 into 10 to the power minus 2. That is equal to what? If you simplify this further, then it comes to 314 by 4. 314 by 4. Now here, if you look into by achieving this k is equal to 314 by 4, you can make sure that your options is going to be either option A or option C. Okay. Now there is a trick. Trick is that without touching your pen and paper also you can say whether it is option A or option C. What is 0 0.05 if you look into the, you know, along that it is the amplitude. A is the amplitude. So this is 0. Point, this 0 0.5 what you see. This is nothing but the amplitude. So without calculating that omega, you can say by using the concept of elimination, that option A is correct. Still, for the sake of completeness, let me evaluate and show you that exactly how we are getting the value of omega as well. What is omega? Omega is equal to k into that velocity. Omega is equal to k into v. What is k? k is equal to 314 by 4 into the velocity is given 350 meter per second. So it is 350. Now if you simplify this further, it will, uh, you know, it will comes like uh, 314. So if you simplify further, you will get it is like 27475. 27475. And A is the amplitude. Amplitude is equal to 0 0.05, which is clearly evident from the you know yeah, from the graph. So we get the equation. So we get the equation. as y is equal to 0 0.05 into sine kx k is 314 by 4 into x uh, let me come back to your question so 314 divided by divided by 4 into x minus 27475 into t and as you see this is the equation of the curve what we obtained and hence the correct option is a so we get the correct option as a we get the correct option as a yeah i got a question that how come i know that this is a sine curve so the diagram says it is a clearly a sine curve because you see that um, uh, you know the pattern of the curve gives us the you know, clear indication it is a sine curve. Okay. It is not required to mention where is pi by 2 and where is pi because we see the upper half is exactly equal to the lower half with respect to the. Ah, that doesn't matter. That whatever the ratio is that, that doesn't matter. But, but the point is that that may not be because you do not know, you know what scale it is taking. Because uh, 
uh, that pi is in radian, that angle, but here we are mentioning the value. Na? Whatever the pi we consider during the, you know, uh, that pi is in radian. Okay. So, uh, next question, let's proceed to the next question. And if we look into the next question, this is a question from thermodynamics. And the question is that delta u is equal to zero. Uh, I'm not sure whether you all went through thermodynamics by this time or not. But, uh, you know, if the delta u is equal to zero in a non-cyclic process of an ideal gas, then what could be the process? Generally, you know, there is a, you know, you know, conception that if that, you know, delta u is equal to zero, okay, we assume that it is an isothermal process. But it is not generally true that when delta u is equal to zero, it is an isothermal process. For example, in an ideal gas, by definition, there is no interactions between the particles, no intermolecular forces. So, pressure change at constant temperature does not change the internal energy. So that means delta U is equal to zero, that is the internal energy. But whereas in the real gases, the real gases have what? They have intermolecular interactions, attraction between molecules at low pressure and a repulsion at high pressure. So their internal energy changes with change up in pressure even if temperature is constant. So that it is possible in case of a real gas to change the internal energy by just changing the pressure without, you know, affecting the temperature. That means keeping the temperature as constant. So it, we cannot say that it must be an isothermal process. So the process is then, you know, maybe an isothermal process, hence the correct option is A. So, uh, here we get the correct option as A, which is the, uh, you know, maybe an, it is an isothermal process. Sir. Yeah. Sir, in the 17th question. Um, the current so flows from positive to the negative and is positive to the negative to be which is left to right, correct. So why is it from right to left? So the point is that if you see uh, just a minute, can you this one you are talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the point is that uh, if you see that current is flowing from uh, uh, you know, the flow of electron is from what? B to A. Huh? Flow of electron is B to A. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you are correct actually. The current is flowing from left to right. Yeah, true. Correct, Bharat? Yeah, but like you said, it's from right to left. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's uh, proceed to the next question, which is question number 20. So here the question is that two speakers, A and B, placed at one meter apart, each produce sound wave of frequency 1800 hertz in phase. A detector moving parallel to the line of speakers distant 2.4 meter away detects a maximum intensity at O and then at P. 
So the question here is that what is the speed of sound wave? So if you look into the question, so let me give a you know a diagram of this one. So here is uh, the speaker A and here is the speaker B. So first and foremost is that, uh, let me draw a straight line first. So now the first intensity, you know, that maximum intensity is observed at the point O. At the point O. And the distance between A and B as it is given is 1 meter. And a a detector moving parallel to line of speakers at a distance 2.4 meter. That means it is going in this, this dictator is going in this one, in this path. So first it detect, dictates at the point O of the maximum intensity. Then it dictates at the maximum intensity at the point P. And the distance between these two parallel lines is 2.4 meter. So that means if we see this distance is 2.4 meter. The question is that what is the speed of the sound if this is the condition that maximum intensity is first observed at O and then at P. So from the laws, we know that the first maxima after O uh, let me first complete the solution, then I'll come back to your question. The first maxima after O will appear when path difference when the path difference that is path difference we denote by delta s is equal to the equal to the wavelength lambda so that means what if we draw that one sorry this is b and we this is the point O. First, what we are going to do is that let us connect this, connect this, this that P and A. So then, according to this, what we get the lambda, lambda is equal to AP minus BP. So this implies lambda equal to AP. What is AP? From the Pythagoras theorem, we can find it out. So by the way, this is one meter. that is 2.4 whole square 
plus 1 square which is 1 minus BP that is 2.4. So if you simplify further then you will get lambda is equal to 0 0.2. Now what is the velocity of sound? The velocity of sound is nu into lambda is equal to nu into lambda that is equal to that whatever the frequency is given 1800 into lambda it is 0 0.2 that is meter per second that is equal to 360 meter per second and we get the correct option yeah sure let me complete so we get the correct option as okay the path difference so first and foremost thing is that of the maximum intensity okay there is a rule in uh, we can discuss during the you know discussion of sound is that the path difference is that whenever you see the difference of intensity maximum intensity that actually comes to the peak point when and that is differed by the you know wavelength because if you look into the wavelength what we discussed in the uh, one question a uh, couple of questions back is that if you see you will always find the peak at when it is in the distance of the wavelength let me go back to the previous question it has a little relationship with this one so this is this to this length is the wavelength now so if you look into this one this point if you find the first peak and another peak will find the other one so keeping this in mind so what happened is that so this is the fundamental you know understanding here that after the first maximum of intensity we received at any point ne next maximum intensity will come after the wavelength difference that is called the path difference again you will get the next maximum intensity after the next wavelength so that is why as the first intensity maximum intensity observed at the point o and the ne next intensity maximum intensity observed at the point p so the path difference means what path difference is that ap minus bp because that is the difference between these two because p is a point now so there is a path difference means from where to where the sound is actually moving from the speaker a it is moving to point p again from point b from speaker b it is moving to point b so there is a difference so that difference is called the you know lambda and after that we compute that how to find the value of lambda and after that what it comes is that you know the velocity of sound is equal to that frequency into the wavelength and that's why we follow any question please a to p yeah it will go to a to p correct i never mentioned q no it will not go to a to o a to p first first it's from a to o and b to o after that read the question so if you read the question a detector a detector means uh, an instrument which detects the intensity of the of the speakers a detector moving parallel to the line of the speaker that means a detector if i use a different color okay a detector is moving along this a detector is moving in this path and it is finding wherever we find the maximum intensity first maximum intensity it came at o at that time what is the path difference ao minus bo but that is not our point of you know discussion because it is mentioning that after some time the maximum intensity again observed at the point p 
what is the path difference ap minus bp and as we discussed few minutes back that the path difference is nothing but the lambda so lambda is equal to ap minus bp all right so if you uh, uh, do not have any question here we can proceed to the next question on projectile motion and if you you know studied projectile motion by this time you must be knowing the few terms called you know <clears throat> let's see uh, whether it is or not okay so there are few fundamentals about the projectile motion about the maximum time of flight that and what is the maximum height is obtained and all these things so to begin with that the fundamentals about the projectile motion is that a motion is said to be in projectile motion if it is actually you know released you know from a height with the initial velocity if the initial velocity is not there then it is not a projectile motion okay let me tell you uh, fundamentals about the projectile motion so that we can you know it will be meaningful to the discussion and you will see how we can apply the vector concept to solve this problem very you know quickly here it is if you uh, suppose uh, this is the you know uh, you know floor and this is the building this is the top of a building so there is a building suppose from that building you drop a ball with an initial velocity so the ball will come like this it will fall like this you take another ball and and you just release it without any initial velocity so it will come down and it will fall it here correct so one is coming here and another is actually taking this path now the question is that that which ball will touch the ground first can you please write your answer in the chat box that which ball suppose here is the ball one which uh, you know uh, here is the ball one and here is the ball two so i repeat the statement once more from the top of the building because this question has relevance to this you know this, this, the, the discussion has relevance to our to this question so this is the top of the building t from the top of the building first ball has been thrown with an initial velocity suppose there is an initial velocity of u it has been thrown and you know due to gravity it will come down and then it will finally touch that ground and for that suppose it took the time t1 and you take another ball and here is the initial velocity is zero because you just release the ball from your hand and it touched up uh, uh, so it take the time t2 okay so my question is that which one is true t1 is greater than t2 or t1 is equal to t2 or t1 is less than t2 so i'll wait for a minute uh, to for your answer uh, you know so that we can start our discussion Yeah, so the uh, the statement is that T1 is equal to T2, and how come it happens? That is called the you know physical independence of motion. So what it says is that when the motion happens, that vertical motion doesn't influence by the horizontal motion, and similarly, horizontal motion is not influenced by the vertical motion. 
so from that idea we can say it is a it will take both the both the balls will reach the ground at the same time now how we can use that concept of vector to solve this problem very quickly that i am going to show you so think in this way and one thing that when it is a uniform velocity when we say u is the uniform velocity by which it has been thrown that means this velocity is not actually you know changing at all into the entire journey of the projectile so what we say is that something like this is that suppose this is the projectile motion okay let me draw it properly after that we'll discuss huh? just give me a minute to draw it Suppose this is the origin, here the projectile is thrown with a velocity v with an angle of theta, okay. Now it reached the height h here, same height, here also it is the height h. Suppose this point we define as S and this point it is defined as T. So that means travel time take to travel from O to S is actually one second. If I join these two points. Sorry to take time to talk this one. So this is this time is this is one vector. And then this is there is another vector. This one. So what we are defining is that T is T. TST is the time to travel from S to T. So TST is that that is equal to time to travel from S to T. That is equal to what? That is equal to time taken to travel from O to T minus travel time taken travel from O to T to O to S. You can apply the concept of position vector also. Position vector and the displacement vector. So S T is the displacement vector, and the displacement vector S T is equal to position vector of the point T minus position vector of the point S. And how much time it took? It took 3 minus 1 second that is equal to 2 second TST. Now let us consider a midpoint of S and T that is M. Let us give that point M and we join that OM. If we join OM, let M be the midpoint of ST. Let M be the midpoint of ST. So then what we can find? So from here, uh, what we can find is that the time to travel from OM is equal to time travel from OS, O2S, right, plus 
S to M plus time travel from the path S to M. And what is time travel from O to S? We know this is one second. And time travel from S to M is nothing but half into time travel from S to T because M is the midpoint. Now I was expecting a question that how come that time travel from you know S to M is equal to the time travel from M to T. Though the distance is same, how come the time travel can be equal? What could be the reason? You can type your answer if you you know you think that what could be the reason. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, the question is that I said that time travel from S to M, M is the midpoint of S and T. So time travel from S to M is equal to the time travel from M to T. How come it be possible? How come that time travel from S to M is equal to time travel from M to T? Based on what logic it can be equal? So the reason is that uh, u cos theta doesn't change, but uh, um, yeah, that is the reason because the initial velocity, you know, initial velocity with which this has been thrown, the condition of a projectile motion is that that velocity has to be uniform and the entire journey. Okay. So then that is why it is equal. And another question I was expecting that how come I can consider the time as a vector, right? I can consider displacement as a vector. I can consider the velocity as a vector, but how come I can consider the time as a vector? The answer is that here, the time is equally proportional to the you know displacement because the initial velocity is same the, because the velocity is uniform initial velocity is not same it's not the right statement the velocity is uniform so at equal interval of time the displacement is happening equal so displacement is a vector so we can consider as it is proportional from a conceptual point of view we can consider the time is also you know synonyms with this vector concept as long as, as like displacement otherwise if you use the projectile formula it may take long time so that is why what we get we get tom is equal to 1 plus one plus one by two into two because t is t is two so that is equal to two seconds now the time travel from O to M is equal to the time travel from M to the end of the projectile. Suppose let's consider this is equal to, you know, D. D is the destination. Okay. So what we get? The time travel from TOD that we can say. So the total time taken is that TOD is equal to two times TOM because it is two times because the uniform velocity in the arrow the horizontal remains the same. So that is equal to two into two, that is equal to four second. And we get the correct option as C.
we get the correct option as C. I hope all of you understood this question. In case of any doubt, please do not hesitate to let me know the same. Okay, all right. So let's proceed to the next question, which is question number 22. So here the question is, the diagram shows the arrangement of three small uniformly charged spheres A, B, and C. The arrows indicate the direction of the electrostatic force acting between the spheres. For example, the left arrow of sphere A on sphere A indicates the electrostatic force. on sphere A due to sphere B and at least two of the spheres are positively charged then which sphere if any at all okay could be negatively charged now if you look into the uh, diagram it is evident that the spheres B and C repel each other because of this arrow this arrow indicates that that b and c repel each other which means both b and c are of the same time otherwise how can they can repel now according to the question at least two fears should be positively charged since attraction occurs for the two remaining pairs it can be concluded that the sphere A is negatively charged. Correct. And hence the correct option is A. Okay. Any question before we proceed to the next one? Okay. So let's proceed to question number 23. The resultant of A and B makes an angle alpha with A and beta with B. Then which one of these among these four options is correct? So those who have studied you know vector algebra or motion in a plane uh, we'll be able to understand what I'm going to draw now. Suppose this is vector A. And this is vector B. So this is a vector. And this is B vector. So the resultant, how we can find the resultant? So let me solve Bharat, then you'll understand whether your answer is correct or not. So if we complete the parallelogram, so this will be the resultant one. This is the resultant vector. According to the question, the resultant vector makes an angle alpha with the vector A and beta with the vector B. So let's assume the angle between the vectors be theta. So this angle is theta we are assuming. Then our understanding of uh, that alpha, tan alpha is what? So we can write tan alpha is equal to B sin theta by A plus B cos theta. 
and similarly we can find tan beta in the same concept because in that case we can see that the vector b makes an angle beta with the resultant vector then we can write in the same concept it is equal to a sin theta divided by b plus a cos theta now if you look into the four options it is mentioning that alpha less than beta so now i will first solve mathematically and then i will show you that how without using mathematics also you can just tell that which one option is correct but if i say right now then you will not able to you know enjoy the derivation so now our point is that alpha is less than beta if alpha is less than beta then definitely if you remember the tan curve or you know the behavior of tan trigonometric function then tan alpha has to be less than tan beta tan alpha less than tan beta means what we just derived tan alpha is equal to we just derived tan alpha is equal to b sin theta divided by a plus b cos theta that must be less than a sin theta divided by b plus a cos theta now let's simplify all the quantities numerator and denominator all are positive why you know because theta is in acute angle okay we are assuming here theta is an acute angle for the sake of our simplicity so in that case all these values are positive so what we can do we can if we cross multiply then the sign of inequality remains the same so that is b sin theta into b plus a cos theta is less than a sin theta into a plus b cos theta so now let's have this equal become b square sin theta plus a b sin theta cos theta is less than a square sin theta plus a b sin theta cos theta now a b sin theta cos theta is there in both sides of the inequality so it gets a remote so what you can do we can now tell b square minus a square into sin theta is less than zero from here what you can say we can say b square minus a square is less than zero assuming since sin theta is greater than zero because we are assuming theta is in the first quadrant acute angle so now what you can conclude that b square minus a square is less than zero so that implies we can write b plus a into b minus a is less than zero when the product of two quantities are less than zero in abstract mathematics point of view you should make this statement very clear that this means either b plus a is less than zero and b minus a is greater than zero either this is true or So either this is true or what you can say is that that b plus a is greater than 0 and b minus a is less than 0. But you see that b and a we are considering as a positive. So b plus a is less than 0 is not an option. So that means b plus a is greater than 0 and b minus a less than 0 this is true so from here what we can conclude we can conclude that b minus a is less than 0 that implies what b is less than a that implies a is greater than b yeah sure 
So the point is that in the inequality point of view, you know, when we say that B plus A product of two quantities, I can explain you, uh, you know, by means of, uh, you know, the theory is it is like this. So I'm using a different color. So whenever we see this kind of stuff, you know, it is a mathematical concept of, uh, you know, linear inequalities. Suppose we get something x minus alpha, x minus alpha into x minus beta is less than 0. What we can conclude? We can conclude this means either x minus alpha is less than 0 and x minus beta is greater than 0 obviously no because one has to be less than 0 other has to be greater than 0 then their product will be less than 0 no? or it could be x is x minus alpha is greater than 0 and x minus beta is less than 0 now if you combine it could be greater than 90 degree also possible but for the sake of simplicity, we are considering that it is, you know, less than zero. For the sake of simplicity, we are considering less than zero. Okay. So now, so, so if we if we if we look into this thing, that implies what? X is so this implies either x minus alpha x is less than alpha and x is greater than beta or x is greater than alpha and x is less than beta if you combine all these things you know what you'll get you will get that x is in between the minimum of alpha and beta and maximum of alpha and beta that means x is greater than minimum of alpha and beta and less than maximum of alpha and beta that is the concept we have used here similarly if you get this thing that x minus alpha into x minus beta is greater than zero this implies what so let me derive this thing so that you will get little idea and I can also give you a little idea about the wavy curve method. Okay, so suppose x minus alpha into x minus beta is greater than zero. So x minus before that x minus alpha into x minus beta less than zero will give you this conclusion that x is in between the minimum of alpha and beta and maximum of alpha and beta. Give you, let me give you an example. If we write x minus 2 into x minus 7 is less than 0, that actually gives an idea which one is the minimum between 2 and 7, that is 2, right? So 2 less than x less than maximum between 2 and 7, we can directly conclude this thing. I'm coming back to the question. So this implies what? This implies either the product of two quantities can be greater than zero either x minus alpha is greater than zero and x minus beta is greater than zero or x minus alpha is less than zero and x minus beta is greater than zero because if both the quantities are positive then the product is uh, mm, you know positive or if both the uh, I'm sorry I need to write it is less than zero uh, if both the both the quantities are negative then their product is also greater than zero correct so from there so from there what we can conclude is something like this is that this implies that either x is greater than alpha 
and x is greater than beta or x is less than alpha and x is less than beta so from there you think in this one that x is less than x is greater than alpha and x is greater than beta so that gives us an idea that x is greater than maximum of alpha and beta if we say x is greater than 2 and x is greater than 7 both are true at the same time what we can conclude x is greater than 7 so what we can say we can say either x is greater than maximum of alpha and beta or x is less than minimum of alpha and beta so it says what that means that um, if x is less than alpha and x is less than beta both at the same time that means what x is minimum of alpha and beta that is also possible that is the only thing so from this conclusion what we can say is that so this is a conclusion if we see any inequality that x minus alpha into x minus beta is greater than zero then you can always consider or either x is greater than maximum of these two alpha and beta or x is less than minimum of these two alpha and beta so that means what if we get this kind of inequality x minus 2 into x minus 7 is greater than 0 this actually conclude us either x is greater than maximum of 2 and 7 that is 7 or x is less than minimum of 2 and 7 that is 2. Similarly later we will find when you will have a you know class of inequality I am just as though it is not so far whatever we are discussing linear inequalities is relevant to this question but uh, you know there are something what additional I can mention here if you get this kind of question something like that that you know x minus 1 power 3000 into x plus 1 power 1001 into x plus 3 power 55 divided by you know x plus 1 so x plus half power 2 into x minus 7 power 370 is less than 0 we can find this kind of inequality solution to this kind of inequality very easily using a method called wavy curve method okay so that we'll be discussing when we'll in future you know uh, we'll discuss about that how wavy curve method can give us a solution to this question very quickly now let me go back, get back to the question but uh, then it will reduce a parallelogram with acute angle yeah so the point is that see the thing is that okay before answering to this question i let me tell you from a very fundamental concept think about there are two forces acting on one force is a and another force is b and the force a is more than b definitely the resultant force whatever you see the resultant force that should be inclined towards a isn't it that means the alpha has to be less than beta from a very practical point of view think about there are two forces acting on it okay on a on a object okay uh, one is you know a is you know pulling with a force of 200 newton and b is pulling with a you know force of suppose you know 100 newton so the resultant force will actually towards be more inclined towards a more inclined towards a means what its angle with the vector a should be smaller than the angle with the vector b so from that concept without you know doing any mathematical derivation you can answer yes it is okay so the point is that uh, you know as there is a question by akanka and i think varat eventually replied that one uh, so if it is theta is greater than 90 and this thing then also you can as varat said that is also you know the point anyway so now let's uh, uh, if you have if you do not have any doubt in this question then you can go to the next one 
okay so if you look into this question question number 24 is that a block of unknown mass sorry there is a typo not os it is of of a block of unknown mass is at rest on a rough horizontal surface a force f is applied to the block the graph in the following figure shows the acceleration of the block with respect to the applied force okay so the question is that from this information how we can you know tell what is the mass of the block is okay so from newton's second law of motion what we can say okay so let's see so from newton's second law of motion what we can say is that okay just a minute let me use a different color as we are using throughout this session newton's second law of motion What you can say, we can say that force is equal to mass into acceleration. Let's keep this as equation number one. Now, from the graph, what we can conclude, we see that a force of what is the force? Force is it is here. It is 16, though it is not mentioned. It is 16. So, a force applied from 16 minus 4. So, force applied f is equal to 16 minus 4 correct 16 minus 4 that is equal to 12 12 newton force is applied and due to this application of the force what is the acceleration we get acceleration we get is from 0 to it is 6 the acceleration is become 6 meter per second square so acceleration we get it is 6 minus 0 meter per second square so that is equal to 6 meter per second square now if we apply in this equation these values will get 12 is equal to m into 6 that implies m is equal to 2 kg and we get the so we get How come? No, it is force is equal to mass into acceleration. Yeah, that's what we are getting. Two kg. So we get the so we get the option C as correct. You can use the slope. That is fine. But without using the slope, also you can find. You need to from this graph, you need to find what is the value of the force value of the force is 16 minus 4 and value of the acceleration is 6 minus 0 so from there we can find that option c is the correct one so i hope this is clear then we can go to the next question and that could be eventually our last question for today then we'll resume the rest of the five questions in the next class so this question tells that that weight of an object E option E normal reaction between ground and the object option B gravitational force exerted by the earth on the object option C dependent on frame of reference and option D net force on the object so what you can say from here is that the weight of an object is the gravitational force exerted on the object. For object close to surface of the earth, it is approximately equal to gravitational force on the object by the earth. So obviously option B is the correct one. And 
uh, option B, we get the option B as the correct one. Sir, but the uh, R, the weight is equal to mass into gravitational force, no sir? Yeah, correct. So can you please write your question so that uh, we can discuss? Yeah, I'll prefer you can write. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Could you please write your question? Huh. Mass into, yeah, absolutely, M into G, correct. The point is that the weight of an object is gravitational force exerted by the earth on the object. Otherwise, you're not able to, you know, weight is what? Weight is nothing but a force, right? Because M into G, so that's what? M into a mass into acceleration. So unless there is a G, there is no point of having the force. So unless there is a gravitational force exerted by the earth on the object, there is no acceleration. That is called acceleration due to gravity, which is G. And another question what I received is that because uh, many questions on lift accelerates and weight changes this thing, uh, um, weight is equal to M into G, correct, absolutely correct. I see the question from Guru Prashad, okay, the Bharat said, that because in many questions, so it depends the frame of reference. Yeah, frame of reference is that, you know, absolutely that is the correct question, correct point, the frame of reference, but you need to also, you know, think about the frame of reference with respect to the options. The weight of an object is, you need to always be context sensitive to the, you know, your answers should be context sensitive to the options. Out of these four options, you really cannot find that how frame of reference can change the option, it is not, right? And in fact, in view of this, I must say that you look into the next question and here the frame of reference play a big role. The work done by kinetic fraction on a body, whether it can be negative or positive or it can be all the three, positive, negative or zero. And as I suggested in the last class, you can send me your answer what you think because this question needs a very in-depth understanding of the frame of reference okay anyway so i'm done with the questions for today uh, we'll resume from uh, you know next class uh, which is on wednesday at same time um, if you have any question please feel free to me now uh, you can either write me um, in the chat box or you can place your question in our you know announcement group or you can in fact call me anytime uh, later so uh, so we'll always I'll suggest strongly that you register in our you know group whatsapp group and do contact and uh, Please read the you know message what we send in the WhatsApp group. So after uh, that 15th August will be our next class, and after 15th August, whoever wants to join, so please do contact in that uh, you know the number provided. <coughs> Let me uh, look into the question. So I, I got a question: Is that just a minute? Can you please explain the intensity detector sum again? Absolutely. Let me go back to the question. So I think it was question number uh, 19 uh, or 20. Yeah. See, the point is that if you look into this question, yeah, Anaga, is the intensity, the intensity, you know, intens intensity of a sound actually come over a period of time. Okay. I do not know whether you have experienced this thing, you know, um, uh, practically, that whenever you see that some music is coming from very far and there are, you know, multiple sources of that one, then you will see a peak of that voice once and after some time again the peak of the voice comes. Okay. So now that dictator in this case is actually parallel moving parallel. OP line, along the OP line it is moving. 
and the distance between from the two speakers A and B, uh, and it is moving in parallel to that and distance is 2.4 meter. Now, the first and fundamental point is that the maximum you know, intensity after the point O appeared in the point P. So that means definitely the path difference is lambda. I can explain you offline that how come the path difference become lambda. For that, we need to go back to the, you know, uh, you know, we need to go back to uh, that sound wave and how, you know, it different, you know, attributes, then you'll understand. Okay, now next question what I got is that sine curve. I think this is the one. Okay, you see here, you know, this is uh, Okay. So that is the way the path difference is. So I, I can explain you over next another class that you know how sound wave works is that, that that is the way the path difference path difference means is that the distance between two peaks one peak is that happened between the that ap minus bp is the path difference there it happened the peak again ao minus no that should not be op op is what op is that we get o and again we get at p but that is not path difference path difference is that is from that AP from the first source of that, you know, mic, what is that distance? It is AP and the second source of the mic that is BP. So as they are coming in the same phase, there is a path difference is AP minus BP. Yes, Bharat, we can take it, uh, this question offline. Uh, okay. And uh, the, the another question what I got is that, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, the sine curve, you see. So this curve shows that it is a sinusoidal curve. So its general equation is y equal to a sine kx minus omega t, where o, a is the amplitude, it is given from the diagram that amplitude is 0 0.05 meter. But the most important part is to find the lambda because that is the fundamental. If we miss to find, calculate the value of lambda properly, all the other points will get mistaken. So the point is that if you see there are five such things, so and it is by two, one, two, so there are five now. If you look into it here, this is one, then two, then three, then four, then five. In each of, of the half of that wavelength, so five lambda by two is equal to 20 because it has been achieved in 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters, that means lambda equal to eight centimeter, which gives us eight into 10 to the power minus two meter. So that means k is equal to 2 pi by lambda. Okay. What is k? As I explained the earlier, that k is nothing but the you know number of wavelengths per unit length. That is 2 pi by lambda. We found the value of k. Then what is omega? Omega is nothing but k into v. That also we found. And then we apply these values and we get it. Uh, if you have any further question, please ask me. Uh, uh, otherwise, um, uh, we can continue our discussion in the next class. I suggest you to, uh, you know, provide your comments. Look into our YouTube, uh, you know, videos, all these recordings. Please provide your comments there. Okay, and uh, I'll see you in the next class. Good night.